Hi everyone, this is Chris Clement, Senior Director of Business Development here at Statflow, and I'm very happy to bring you this next episode. I caught up with Michelle Dunnigan from Roadster to learn how they enable auto dealers to modernize the customer experience. Roadster is one of the leaders in digital retailing, and Michelle talks through the mindset that's needed to take a dealership into the 21st century. Thanks for joining us, Michelle. First and foremost, you know, I've been in the industry for a little bit and I know a little bit about Roadster, but I'd love to hear, you know, your thoughts on the company, what you guys are doing and kind of what you do there. So Roadster is what we consider an omni-channel commerce platform for um, the automotive industry. And uh, that might sound like a little bit of a fancy word. Uh, We live in this category that's pretty broad called digital retailing. Um, And the reason why we talk about omni-channel and we talk about platform is because we really are focused on the the end-to-end customer journey and building a a platform that is not only for consumers to to purchase vehicles digitally, um, whether they're online or in the physical showroom, our application works in, in both places, but also to help the dealership have a better selling experience. And so we really are running the gamut of what that buying journey looks like and trying to help dealers uh, digitize their sales process from end to end. Great. And so your role in your head of marketing. Yeah. So I'm the chief marketing officer at Roadster. I've been at Roadster for uh, about five years. I've been in the automotive industry for uh, about 15 or so. I used to tell people that I don't come from automotive, but after 15 years, I guess you can't say that anymore. Yeah. Um, so there we are. But uh, yeah, I run I run marketing. Um, so everything that is related to the to the brand, to the thought leadership, you know, to to working with our our partners and our prospects. I also um, am very heavily invested with our dealer partners because I um, use a lot of uh, uh, that a lot of the stories that I get from them as ways to share best practices with others. So I'm a very boots on uh, chief marketing officer, as you would say. I am constantly on the phone with customers, really trying to understand where their challenges are and you know what they've been doing to be successful. Uh, and then in addition to marketing, generally, uh, I also run our uh, training academy. We call it Roadster Academy, uh, where we help dealers who have onboarded really understand how to use our product as well as our analytics team. So we're a startup, uh, lots of hats, um, but uh, I like to say that the common thread is really my my focus on our dealer partners and um, whether it's insights and, and data or stories, you know, we're always here to help support. Education is a really big part of our of our strategy. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been in a lot of over the last couple of years, OEM meetings where inevitably digital retailing comes up and it's a conversation, but it's not, I don't think anyone really understands truly what to be doing or how to be doing it, but it's, you know, the OEMs are trying to figure it out. The, the, the dealers are trying to figure it out. The dealer groups are trying to figure it out. So it certainly came up in most conversations, which has to be a positive for you guys that everybody's talking about it. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely been a focus over the last uh, many years. Um, it's been interesting to sort of see the the evolution, right? I think, um, you know, if you dial back, like I said, I've been in the industry for 15 years. So there was a time when you would have mentioned, even, even without the fancy buzzword name, like what this is, and dealers would look at you and be like, that is crazy pants. Nobody's going to start buying a car online, right? Like I was in the industry when that was uh, apparent. And so there's been definitely a shift, I think. Uh, a recognition of people wanting to modernize the customer experience. And so uh, it's been evolution, you know, starts with people that are very progressive and just believe fundamentally that they want to change the way that, that their um, customers that are buying cars from them interact with them today. Um, and then all, all the way through, you know, the OEM ecosystem where now, you know, m- most of them have a certified program or have a certified program in the works and are trying to help their dealer partners sort of navigate this road. Um, but we we like to look at it as, um, like I said, it's very end-to-end. It's not only about engaging customers and creating this modern experience, but it's also about making sure that the, that the dealership is much more efficient in the process. So we think it's really a win-win-win, which 
I don't know that there's that many win-win wins in life, to be honest. Um, but uh, uh, that's how we we look at it. Um, but yeah, digital retailing has been it's been a buzzword for sure. It's on everybody's minds. I think what has happened though, it's yes, it's beneficial to us, but it's also a very muddy term. And I think that's why people are very interested in it. They're they're talking about it, but they're not everybody defines it the same way. And so it's been it's been a struggle. And I think you know the vendor community is has a lot to do with that because every company has a slightly different take on what it is and and how to implement it and what best practices are. Um, and, and frankly, companies that sort of sit in an ancillary way now say they have digital retention. So it gets really, it gets really confusing. Um, and so I actually personally spent a lot of time educating the industry on, on what it is and, and what it isn't and the different flavors of it, because I think, you know, everybody's been very confused. Uh, they know that they want to modernize. They, they know they want to improve their sales process, but they, they really don't understand what that term means. So, I mean, what would you say, and I'm going a little off script here, but what would you say to a dealer that's that's like, you know what, the consumer's not ready to buy a car online, or they're not ready to go down that path yet? Um, because, you know, just in my experience, I, I've worked with and been in a lot of dealerships and, you know, technology seems, while it's it's getting there in automotive, it still seems to be lagging in in comparison to some other industries that are out there that are more technological savvy and really wanting to have moved quicker instead of just this like wait and see, you know, model, I guess you could call it. Right. Well, what I would normally tell dealers is that they're, they're right. Um, I think, you know, it's growing over time, but it's still a fairly small percentage of people that like sight unseen want to buy the car a hundred percent online. Um, what really that, that that's not necessarily the problem we're solving right now. The problem we're solving right now is how do we provide tools and capabilities for them to start the process and do a lot of the transactional elements that would take a long time in the dealership to do digitally online. So it's not about necessarily, like I said, it's going to grow over time. So I don't want to yeah. be the, the Debbie Downer that says like, I don't believe that online car price, <laughs> it is the percentage is going to grow, but you have this unique component. And every survey we've ever done um, or anybody in the industry has done has said that at this point in time, the vast majority of consumers want to come in and test drive the car. They want that experience. What they don't like is the experience of being there for three, four or five hours with the transaction. So you have to look at what what problem are you solving for from a consumer mindset perspective. And it really is about making it much more of an efficient process than it is about, you know, the vast majority of them wanting to go from A to Z self-service on their on their own time. Yeah, I mean, that's a certainly a painful process if, when you've made your decision or at least come close to making your decision of what vehicle you want to buy. And then, you know, I mean, the fun part's going there and test driving a vehicle. Yeah. The worst part is sitting there for two or three hours, um, you know, after the fact. I mean, COVID, COVID actually even put a finer uh, point on this because we had uh, a lot of dealerships, um, at least that I spoke to say, you know, we were, cl we were closed. Like we were closed, closed, like doors were locked mm -hmm. or by appointment only. And we couldn't keep the consumers away. I'm not saying it was in droves. Like I don't want to, obviously there's been a major impact um, on demand over time, but what, what I'm saying is, is that even when they couldn't, customers still wanted to come. Um, even when they were offering remote test drives, customers still wanted to come. And so it, again, it's really what problem are you trying to solve? And I, I think the problem we're trying to solve is really creating a, a very efficient experience for both the customer and the dealer, as well as you know what that ends up doing, which is driving customer satisfaction in, in the end. Absolutely. So, I mean... We didn't really talk much at the beginning about stat flow, but I mean, we're big proponents of the the one to one, um, you know, building yourself, you know, in a in the local market, and you know, really having it sounds to me like Roadsters doing some of the same things with helping with that customer experience, and you know, obviously dealers care and the OEMs care, and everybody cares about loyalty and they care about retention of their customers. So, you know, maybe tell me a little bit more about kind of the customer experience, the roadster side of things when it comes to, you know, helping on the loyalty side of the business and keeping those customers coming back with that, you know, that one-to-one -one 
experience that every dealer is trying to do. It's just, it's easier said than done. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's actually a big focus of ours because what comes before, you know, repeat business and loyalty is just having a really stellar experience, right? That's what's going to lead to word of mouth and, and repeat business and all that stuff. Um, and so what we've really focused on is creating something that's really simple and modern for the customer to go through and to create that one-to-one relationship with the, the salesperson at the, at the dealership. So what I, we, we actually send out when somebody completes the process through our platform, we'll send out a survey to the customer that bought the car and we'll ask them, uh, first of all, we ask them to rate the, the dealership as, an, as a net promoter score. Um, if you know what that is. Yep. Um, so the, they will rate them. And then, um, and then we ask them things like, how long did it take you to complete the transaction? And, you know, I mean, net promoter score is all around, would you recommend this to a friend? Um, and we do that because we're constantly trying to measure. And what I think is interesting, especially from the Staffalo perspective, is we, we introduced net promoter score, this, you know, would you recommend this dealership to a friend or family member, even though the industry at the time that we did it was focused on CSI, right? The customer satisfaction index. That's that's what all the OEMs measure. The dealers buy. It's a very known automotive term. Um, but we did it because we wanted to benchmark automotive to every other experience that these consumers were having, right? And mm-hmm. so what we found was um, the net promoter score for a, a, an automotive retail provider um, was an average of about 47 when they go through our platform and we do the net promoter score, our average is 85. Wow. <laughs> and so I, I'd like to say our technology takes all sorts of credit for that, but I, I actually think what's happening is expectations typically, I think people, if you've bought a car before, you know, they, they talk about how like I would rather go to the dentist and get a root canal than buy a car, right? So the expectation of what that experience is gonna be like is fairly low. And when you provide them with something that's going to save them time and is delightful, then it just elevates it and takes it to the next level. So that's, that's a piece of it. The other thing that we see is we also ask them open-ended, right? Tell us about your experience. And I'd say 90% of the time, that little review snippet that they send us is not just about the experience and the technology. It mentions the salesperson or the people they worked with by name. And so when you talk about that one-to-one, I think one of the misnomers with technology like ours is that it's going to replace the, the human, right? Like, oh, well, now we've given them self-service tools and they're going to do it all themselves. But this is a big ticket purchase. There's, there's a lot of factors that go into buying a car. And that salesperson can really guide the customer through the process. And they become instrumental. They build relationship outside of the, the transactional pieces of of it that nobody really wants to talk about anyways. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the, that's the gold. That's the key right there is that one-to-one connection in the, in, with the dealership in their local community. And how do they build upon that by using technology just to make it faster, simpler, more transparent. So talking about the CSI component, is that a, a there's a, I would think there's a correlation, right? If a dealer is like, well, I only care about CSI. The OEM only cares about CSI. Can you help me with CSI? I would assume the answer is yes. Like based on what we're we're providing, we're going to help you. And there's you probably have metrics around how much you're going to help them. Yeah, I mean, I think you know CSI is interesting. Um, most people in the industry know you know it's a great metric. It can also easily be skewed. Um, so, you know, we don't look at it closely, but we do anecdotally hear from our dealer partners when it has significantly increased, um, you know, satisfaction increasing net promoter score is clearly going to translate into, you know, satisfaction in CSI. We know all sorts of things are, are tied to that, right? Um, dealer incentives and, and things like that. So um, it definitely does translate into, um, you know, higher satisfaction overall, however, however you measure it. You've said in the past that, you know, 20% of tech, you know, the technology is really only 20% of the equation. It, it comes down to, you know, and you just mentioned it, you know, the, you know, creating a better experience, having the salespeople create that experience. Um, you know, when it comes to training your dealers and, and creating a process around it, um, you know, maybe you could tell me a little bit more about that and how you're, 
you're getting them to maybe think differently and really, um, you know, use the technology, but use it as only part of the equation and, and get better at, you know, that whole customer experience, you know, journey per se. Yeah, no, for sure. And we do, um, say that, you know, and, and believe wholeheartedly that 80% of it is what you do with it, right? We're, we're not the star in this, the, the dealer and the operator and how they train their team is really the, the star in whether or not this, you know, technology is going to be successful for them. Um, and what it really comes down to is mapping out what your core objectives and your goals are. So we work with all of our dealer partners to understand, you know, what are you trying to accomplish first and foremost? Are you trying to just sort of modernize the customer experience and, and offer this and engage with more customers? Are you trying to make it faster? You know, do you track how much time it takes to sell a car right now? Are you trying to, to streamline that experience so that it's faster for the customer and for yourself? Are you looking to create a um, journey that doesn't change or waver whether the customer's online or in your showroom? Like, what, what are you trying to accomplish? Right? Are you doing cost cutting measures, which is you know something obviously has come up with um, COVID. So um, we we really want to get to the root of that, and then we have all sorts of ways to help them map out what does your ideal sales process look like. Um, and it's not so much the technology; the technology is there to facilitate you know that sales process. Um, but a lot of times, it's really just around what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to go to one person selling, which is very common these days, um, not one price, but one person, right? Where you're empowering your salespeople, like those types of goals and initiatives help us really understand how to train them on the technology to be successful towards that end state. Um, so, and then, like I said, in the beginning, you know, what we do once we understand that with them is not only do we train them on our technology, but we really truly do partner to try to figure out how to help them train their team, move their process along, and then share best practices. You know, I think that the thing that um, I've always truly believed is that dealers do not want to hear from me or us, Roadster. They don't. I mean, we're on this podcast right now, but people would rather have another dealer on this podcast, to be honest, than, than me. And, and I'm very clear on that, you know, that because um, I'm that way from a marketing perspective, I go to a marketing conference and I don't want to hear from a vendor. I want to hear from another CMO. Like that's just right. You want to hear it from them. So, um, so we really try as, and, and we've created a community of dealers who want to share with one another. And so we'll pick up, we'll say, okay, this is your goal. Well, I'm going to share all the best practices that we've learned from our other dealers. In fact, I might even connect you with somebody that has done this really well so they can learn from one another. Absolutely. I don't know if we're shifting gears here, but you know, one of the things, again, I, I go to a lot of conferences and everybody stands up there and talks millennials, 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 millennials. We've got to figure out millennials. How are we going to sell to millennials? So how, you know, what approach have you guys taken? I mean, I'm assuming it's, it's just an evolution of your tool that it, it, you know, it's, these are the new buyers that are coming into the market and they want to buy and transact in a different way. And, you know, it sounds to me that you guys are meeting that need, you know, in some form or fashion. So, yeah, I mean, what's interesting about that generation is they were literally, literally born with one of these in their hands, right? <laughs> so, so the technology component, anytime you can introduce technology, it's just very familiar for them. But I don't know about you, but I'm not a millennial. <laughs> I'd love to, to go back and, and say that I was in that age group. I'm not anymore. Uh, but what I will say, and I always say this to people because they want to focus on the millennial buyer, is, you know, when was the last time an Amazon package was dropped off at your house? Probably this morning. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think I have one outside right now. So I, During COVID, they've been coming a lot more than usual. Right. So I think, you know, people want to really focus on how do we engage that generation. But the reality is, is the behaviors we're talking about when we're talking about the millennial buyer is now everybody. You know, my mother, who once one day a long time ago called me and asked me um, if AOL was her um, internet browser and her email, she was very confused as to what it was. Um, <laughs> so now she's ordering her groceries online, Amazon packages are being delivered to her house. 
right? She's done Zoom calls with me. Everybody, I think, on the planet has done some kind of video conferencing over the last five months. So I, I always push people back a little bit on that question because I said, who isn't really behaving like that today from a buying perspective? I think that the interesting conversation or the twist I would put on that is around the millennial employee, because I do think as much as we talk about millennial buyers, you know, you look at the traditional dealership and, you know, years ago, it was especially what was very focused on older generations. And so now they're trying to attract that younger generation as an employee, which by the way, will engage better with the millennial buyer, right? So there's a lot of changes at the dealership level that need to happen in order for that population to really embrace the um, uh, employment aspect. And one of them is what type of technology are you using at your store? You know, do, do I have to print something out and bring it to you to sign? Or can we just do that digitally? <laughs> do I have to wait in line at your desk to have you answer a question? Or can I be empowered to do that? Like these are questions that the millennial uh, employee is asking. In fact, we did a study, this is now many years ago, but it's still very relevant, on the millennial um, and job satisfaction, what it would actually take for them to go work at a car dealership. So um, probably for another podcast, but <laughs> I could go on and on about uh, that aspect. Well, I guess to that point, you know, one of the challenges is always at least, I don't know, it's probably always been a challenge, but as long as I've been in the industry, which isn't all that long, has been the turnover in in dealerships. So from your perspective, when you get a dealer up and running and loving Roadster and you know working it, and then six months later, it's an entirely new team there. You know, how are you guys overcoming that? I guess from a training perspective and you know, yeah. from a buy-in perspective, because you could have a whole new decision maker in there as well. I think it really comes down to, do you have a champion in the store? I know it's not directly answering your question, so I'll get there in a second. But, you know, people ask me all the time, like, what makes our technology successful? Is it that the dealership is in a big metro area or maybe they're in a rural area, so there's more, you know, need to do things digitally? Is it that they have high volume? Is it that they're, you know, low volume? Like, what is it? So it's only one thing. <laughs> Is there a champion in the store driving the sales process? And so if there is a champion, the buy-in happens, the training happens, right? If the champion is really going to be the one that lays that sales process down and then ensures that the team is utilizing the application, understands it. If a new person comes in, it's part of their training process from day one. Um, so yes, I mean, we all deal with it. You're right that there's huge turnover in this industry and, and we're constantly training and retraining. But the other phenomenon that has happened is that when people get in and they start using our technology to sell, especially the younger generation, they're happier employees. And so, uh, and this is actually something you were talking about NADA earlier. We um, partnered with NADA and we did a study um, back in May um, because we were really interested in, you know, as much as as we would hate to to have anything like what's happening in the world happen, right? To anybody, it was a really interesting point in time for the automotive industry because they were working in skeleton crews, right? They had to do things remotely, and so we did this study and we started to dive into efficiency. And what we found was that dealership personnel can sell a lot more cars per person than they ever thought possible using digital technology. So if you think about that for a moment, you think about, I, I want to use technology. I want to be more efficient. It would make me happier. It's what I'm used to. And now I can sell more cars myself. That's more income in my pocket. So again, it all translates into employee satisfaction in the end, right? And, and hopefully if you can drive that employee satisfaction, you're going to retain your employees longer. I was at a meeting with a OEM a couple years ago, a very, very high level person within an OEM, a woman. Um, we walked into the meeting, us five guys. And the first question she asked us was, where's your woman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so um, we learned a big lesson that day. Not that we should br just bring any random woman with us, but that as an executive team, we needed to look at ourselves and have more diversity within our leadership team in the company and 
you know, because we had a, a lot of great leaders, but they weren't represented on our website. They weren't represented in you know certain meetings. So um, it's certainly, I don't want to say there's an evolution happening, but it is still a very male dominated industry. So I'd love to hear your take uh, from a from a senior level executive as, as a woman on you know some of the things you're seeing change in the industry. Obviously, we see you know Mary Barra is the CEO of GM now and. Um, I won't mention the person who we met with that said that, but very, very high up at an OEM. So I'd love to hear your take on kind of that evolution. And I think what's finally starting to happen. I mean, I still visited dealerships where they had the, you know, the pinup calendar in the GM's office. And I'm like, what industry that I just, you know, come into, but it's starting to change, I think. And, you know, I'd love to hear your take on that. So, yes, you know, I think that we've made a lot of improvements um, and a lot of progress, but I, I do still think that it's obviously we know this because we still sit in this industry, a very male dominated world still. Um, and I think it's not just women and men. I think it's just diversity in general. So whether it's ethnicity or sexual orientation, like it's just diversity breeds diverse thinking. And so it's always good to start to elevate that and elevate those voices and, and opinions. And I'm always of the belief that people get inspired by what they see. And so it's really important, I think, while it's still not, um, you know, a, a big percentage that we elevate the voices that are there and let people see that it's possible. I mean, I've met some incredible female operators over the last, you know, five years um, in particular, and some that are general managers at their stores you know, others that have, have climbed up through groups um, and also at the OEM level. So I just think um, they're definitely there to inspire. Um, and we'll just continue to see, you know, more and more progress. But the one the one area I actually am and been really focused on lately, and, and actually at, at Roadster, we're talking about this internally too, is the concept of unconscious bias. And, and that actually, I think, because I, I think, yes, you're going to have the dealership that has the, the pinup calendar, as you said, right? That, that's, that still exists. We know it does. Um, but I think for the most part, it isn't even surface level. You know, some of the stuff that, that happens, whether it's promotion related or just in conversation, how people are talking to one another. Um, and so that's, that's an area where I think just collectively as an industry that we could really strive to improve on. And I don't know yet exactly how to do that outside of of Roadster and outside of our own organization, we're certainly taking that on to do some training and make sure that people are thinking about it. And, you know, the, the biggest thing I've learned recently on that topic is it's not just the other gender. It's, it's also women that have unconscious bias and how we um, talk or our assumptions, right? We may be talking to somebody and say, oh, you know, um, so is he around and have no idea if it's a he or she or, or anything like we, we have no concept and it's just general assumptions that are made in conversation. So I, I think that when we focus on those topics as an industry, we're just going to continue to evolve. But um, it's tough. You know, so I, don't, I think, um, you know, for me, I just try to be the best role model that I that I can be. And, you know, I strive to be one of those women that people look at and and say, wow, she did it. You know, I can do it too. So. so if our listeners want to connect with you, where can they find you? Yeah. So the easiest way um, is just directly, um, you know, I work at a startup, so I'm lucky to have a very simple email address, which is just michelle at roadster.com, um, which is a very common name and very unusual <laughs> to, to be there. <laughs> but, uh, welcome to startup land. Um, but of course I'm on, you know, LinkedIn and, and other places too. But if somebody does have direct questions, um, feel free to just email me. I'm always open to speaking to new people. As always, thanks for tuning in. If you're a fan of one-to-one, -one, be sure to give us a five-star review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Catch you next time.